shame to see this one off to such a lousy start. I mean, remember last week, I, I know we have very short attention spans in the age of Twitter, where a tweet that goes longer than 140 characters is considered excessive, where where um, something that happened three hours ago is considered passe. Yeah, last week, ancient history at this point, but a really interesting week, a good week. Uh, we had Obama. I mean, again, I know the president could have been a lot stronger on some aspects of the uh, climate change problem, but what he presented was Encouraging. It was a big step forward considering where we've been at. So, hey, that's great news. The other fantastic news, of course, is the uh, Supreme Court ruling on DOMA. Um, I mean, paving the way for the inevitability of full marriage equality for the GLBT community here in the U.S. A big step forward for Iowa, of course, too. Uh, also, I mean, I, I consider this pretty big news. And I know the entire Iowa congressional delegation voted for the farm bill. But the truth is... It was really good to see that thing go down, especially with a $20 billion hit to the food stamp program. Uh, that was historic to have a bill brought up in the U.S. Congress. I mean, these folks have their act together. In 14 years in the Iowa legislature, I saw that happen twice. It's not a very common occurrence. It happened on the speed, uh, speed, uh, oh, what do you want? Uh, the bill to increase the speed limit. And what was the other one? There was one other bill where uh, it was brought up for debate and then failed. That's a huge embarrassment to the majority leader, which is also always kind of delightful for those of us who are underdogs. Um, but in the, in the U.S. House, to have the farm bill brought down with a coalition of Democrats and Republicans largely over this massive cut to food stamps, I'm sorry, that's delicious. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that because what will ha what'll happen now, they'll have to come back with something that is not quite so draconian, not so, not so harmful, ugh, harmful there, there. There we go. It's Monday. I can speak funny if I want. Harmful to so many people. Here in Iowa, nearly 200,000 people would lose their food stamp eligibility. Or at least you lose a big chunk of what they uh, currently qualify for. Okay, so this week, it's not going so well. It's only Monday. So maybe there's hope. Maybe things will get better. Maybe they'll get worse. Anyway, Monday and not going real well yet. we got bike fatalities. Yeah, we've got, we've got um, you know, evidence about the, the, the record the record contrast in between drought last year and rainfall this year. We've got horrible situations with fires out west. And we've got nitrate, you know, nitrates in our waters that are that are that are off the charts. And I and we're gonna talk about some of that stuff today. We're also gonna talk about uh, talk with Ann Dietrich with the uh, Truth and Labeling Coalition about efforts to uh, to pass legislation at the Iowa State House at the uh, state level regarding GMO labeling. And uh, one of my favorite local musicians, Max Wellman, will be joining us today as well. But first, um, I got to take a second to thank uh, some of our some of the important organizations and businesses that help make this possible. And I know I do this every show, and then you say, "Okay, I will get to the point." You know, move beyond that. Well, I can't because uh, you know this is not corporate radio. This is not corporate media. This is um, an alternative that's supported by groups that like the issues we address, groups that tend not to have deep pockets, but they know the value of this conversation, and by businesses that are small, locally owned, and have a real strong commitment to this community. So again, thank me. Uh, you join me in thanking, thank me. Join me in thanking the Iowa chapter of the Sierra Club, Iowa Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the Great March for Climate Action. And uh, this segment of our show uh, sponsored by Gateway Marketing Cafe, I also want to thank uh, Leonard, Hink, uh, Leonard Tinker Heating and Cooling and also Hawk Restaurant in the East Village and the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit. So, folks, um, again, the businesses, the organizations, and the events that make this show possible, uh, pay attention to them, thank them, and do support them when you can. Okay, so um, where to start? Okay, um, you know, as a biker, I... Uh, 
I read with concern uh, that uh, there have been two fatal bike crashes just this past week. And it's kind of um, sending a wake-up call to the legislature. Who knew that they were sleeping, right? A wake-up call to the legislature that, hey, maybe it's time we start taking this issue a little more seriously. Uh, Sharon Steckman, a state representative from Mason City, um, who, who I've never served with but have come to know reasonably well, she's done some pretty important work on this and is making very little progress. Uh, it just seems like some people, including some of our lawmakers, just don't like bicyclists, they, or they feel that bicycling should be recreational only, and that we have no place being on the streets. Um, I, I have that all the time. I mean, people even very well-intentioned, and, you know, I'll, I'll, be, um, I'll be biking by, and they say, hey, have a nice ride, or hey, it's a great day to ride. And I say, well, I, well, I want to say, hey, it's a great day to drive um, or, hey, have a nice drive. You know, it's uh, this, I'm going to work. I'm going to a meeting. I'm going to a funeral sometime. I'm sometimes I'm going to weddings. You know, I, who knows where I'm going, but I'm usually going somewhere you would often go in your car. And um, to say, have a nice ride would be the equivalent of me, you know, wishing you a lovely Sunday afternoon drive on the country. You know, I, that's, that's all innocent. You know, it's all well intended. And I appreciate the uh, camaraderie, the friendship and all that. They, they, they. The, the Iowa niceness of all that, but I want to get us beyond the idea that because I'm on my bike, I'm just out for a ride. I'm just having fun. I'm actually going somewhere. And so I need to get there as expeditiously as possible, expeditiously, but also safely. So if I can accomplish um, getting there in decent time and still living, that's a good day. All right. So, um, <laughs> but that means usually, that often means I got to be on the road. Now, yesterday I went to work in my garden in the evening the direct shot to the garden's about four miles. It takes me, what, less than 20 minutes, 15 minutes. Once I did it in 13, I was rocking and I had a tailwind. But um, I, I, take the, I can take the scenic route through Waterworks Park and Greenwood Park. It's twice as far. It's a beautiful ride. I did that yesterday, but, you know, that is the equivalent of a Sunday afternoon drive in the countryside. So, um, but, you know, the point is uh, my best route is on the road. So if you, um, if you don't like me being there... It's your problem, not mine. Now, I understand that there are lots of bikers out there who, um, who are, as my friend uh, Leonard Tinker would say, uh, idiots studying to be morons and flunking the test. I mean, there are bikers out there who are an embarrassment to not just bikers, but to the human species. I mean, I cannot believe what some of y'all try to do. Um, you, I, well, I, my, my hope would be, I would really love to see um, authorities start ticketing people for bad biking. Now, the problem is some of the folks driving don't know. Sometimes it's hard to tell bad biking from things you have to do as a bike because we don't have a fully equal access. Okay, for example, uh, if I'm coming, if I'm coming uh, south and east on Cottage Grove, there's this little triangle in the street with a little bike decal on it, very cute, adorable, that tells me I can stop there and I will get a light change. Interestingly, coming to the next block up, there's not one of those. So when I come to that little decal, I do. I stop. I wait. I get my light change. When the next one, if there's no cars to trip the light for me, since I can't do it myself, since they don't have that installed there, I go. Well, I stop. And when there's no traffic, I go. I am not going to get off my bike, you know, put it down on the curb, walk across the sidewalk to the button that's for the pedestrians. I'm not going to push that. You know, if we want to change the law so that drivers have to throw their car in park, unbuckle their seatbelt, get out of their car, walk over and push a, push a button to get a green light, I may reconsider. But as it is now, you know, I'm not going to do that. And I don't think you should. I, I don't think that's the way to go either. I think we have to, again, begin to install these little gizmos elsewhere in the street. Um, so, yeah, there's things that can be done to make biking easier, safer, um, more predictable, uh, and there are, I mean, again, again, one thing that should be done, ticket some of these crazy bikers who just do anything at all, anytime, any place, and they, they're just totally unpredictable. Ticket some of those people. I will not object to that at all. I think it might help to encourage better biking sense. But part of the problem is you drivers as well. I mean, again, I say you, 95% of you, at least 90, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, 95% of you are wonderful, treat me well, respectful. This past week, though, I've run into three of you that, um, that need some help. Uh, one was, I'm coming up Sherman Hill. Actually, no, I'm on Woodland. I'm on the flat part of Sherman Hill. And it's a tight fit because you've got parking either side of the road. And if you've got a car coming at you, 
you got to be somewhat close to the parked car. I don't like to get close to parked cars. Actually, I'm more scared of parked cars than I am of folks driving their cars because I know there's somebody waiting in that car, some driver who doesn't see me because they just ain't paying attention, and they're going to open that car door right into me. That's happened almost twice to me. It happened, um, well, until last week, it happened a third time, and this was really close because uh, I had to be a little bit tighter because of the oncoming traffic. You know, so um, there's this rule that Sharon Stackman, state representative again from Mason City, has been working on to give cars, um, require cars th um, to pass you with three feet to spare. Uh, there's also been discussion about um, making making it clear that bikers have should have about five feet to spare from a parked car. I always try to ride five feet from that parked car. This time I wasn't quite out there, and this gal nearly got me. Very, very unnerving for me. I got a little bit of an apology for her, but I hope she thinks next time. Uh, or I could have ended up like my brother. My brother was doing this. He was in a bike lane, and the bike lane itself was too narrow. The car's parked to his right. I mean, right there. Again, driver opens the door, smash. I mean, he was going maybe 15 miles an hour. He drove the handlebars into his thighs. He went to the hospital. Um, could have died, actually. Easily could have died. Went to the hospital. They stitched him up and sent him home. A couple days later, he's, he's not feeling well. His leg is swelling. He's got an infection goes in. Uh, they had left the uh, cap from the handlebar in his thigh. Okay, Now, that's a medical conversation there. The um, biking conversation is here. here is that not only do we need bike lanes, but we need them to be designed, designed correctly. Ingersoll, by the way, good. Well done. Plenty of room from the parked cars and from the traffic. Well done. But it also takes drivers starting to think, okay? We, um, you know, these two fatalities, I mean, very, very sad. I mean, these are good bikers. Uh, there are occasionally you read about some biker who really is clueless, who's out there in dark clothing with no lights at night, or who's on the wrong side of the road, or who's just doing something else really, really dumb, and they get run over. Again, also tragic, but harder to blame the driver. In, in these cases, you know, uh, the driver's... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. The, I don't know the full story, but these are bikers that know, knew what they were doing. Apparently, um, there'll be more on that as it comes out. But again, this is um, for me. Every week is bike safety week. Every day is bike safety day. I try to live it. Um, I'm really focused on I'm driving when I'm biking because I know that uh, that if you and I have a collision, you and your car, me and my bike, you get a dent. I die a horrible death. So um, the stakes are pretty high for me. And bikers, bikers who have a clue are really paying attention. You need to as well. Um, again, bad start to the week. Two bike fatalities last week. We're already, um, yeah, we're already uh, marching uh, forward at a pace that's ahead of what we've seen in recent years. I got more to talk about here, folks. Uh, we got these uh, fires out west. Interesting and horrible stuff going on there. We've got the um, drought flood conundrum here in Iowa to talk a little bit about. We've also um, also going to talk a little bit about the uh, World Food Prize going to Monsanto. And our European, our European allies are pretty upset at us for, um, for spying on them. I mean, you know, you know, you think about spying, and historically, you think about we spy on the on the Soviet Union; they spy on us. It's all good, you know. Or, or World War II, Hitler, we spy on him; he spies on us. Yeah, it's cool. But now we're spying on our buddies. I mean, it's not just the American people who are getting spied on now; it's our allies abroad, in their places of uh, of, of, of in their government buildings. I don't, I do not blame the Europeans for being a little bit ticked off about this. All right. Um, I hope when we come back, we're going to be hearing from Ann Dietrich. We're going to be talking about uh, the Truth and Labeling Coalition and about the efforts to pass a GMO labeling bill at the Iowa State House. Again, not going too far this year, but she's um, she and her group are hammering away, and hopefully there'll be some progress on that next year. Again, I want to thank Gateway Marketing Cafe. Um, Gateway is a fabulous place, for folks. Again, you've got the complete line of grocery store grocery items there. A lot of it from local sources. You've also got breakfast, lunch, and supper. A great cafe, and I, I love there. And supper's on Monday and Tuesday. I, I believe both Monday and Tuesday are a, 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 a they they cut a couple bucks off the cost, but not off the serving size or the quality. It's really really good stuff. So check it out, folks. Also, want to remind you one of my favorite restaurants in Beaverdale, Tally's Restaurant Bar and Catering. Uh, Tally's has that rooftop seating and also outdoor seating on the street level as well. Um, yeah, check them out, folks. That's Tally's in Beaverdale. I want to remind you of Diana's Wedding Cakes in Newton and also S&P Piano. If you've got a piano to move, 
I hope it's not as big as mine because these guys are um, experiencing back pain um, two years after the fact. Anyway, give them a shout though, s and Piano. Information about all these business partners of mine on the Fallon Forum website at fallonforum.com. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Well, good morning. This is the 7th of June in the Lord's year 2010, and this is day uno one of webcast1live.com. We will begin with Max World Live with my special guest, Tom Coates. In just a minute, there's Tom. Howdy. And uh, we will be live for the very first time on Webcast One Live. back on this and say, gosh, remember that old day in history? Wonder where Walter Cronkite was. He must have been around hanging there too. But actually, it's the beginning of Webcast One Live. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Rob Spearman and everybody who's put together this project together. And uh, we're ready to go live now. So thanks for listening to MaxWorldLive.com. I can't tell you that it's going real well from time to time, but it is going. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Uh, brother, that's Babers Neighbors, folks, and I want to thank our brother Tucker for kicking off our show as they have done for uh, since the beginning of this program back in September of 2009. It's uh, hard to believe, Maddie, we've been going on for that long, isn't it? I know you haven't been with me that long, but uh, if you had been, you would have been still in uh, what middle school anyway. <laughs> hey, um, we got more to talk about today uh, on a bunch of other issues on national security issues, uh, and now now the Europeans are mad at us. Um, I'm going to throw a little bit of fun at you with um, some comments about Donald, Donald Trump and the Iowa State Fair's latest uh, gastronomical. They're being called delights, but I think atrocities is a better word. I mean, come on, hot beef sundaes? That's not a delight. That's something you think about and then barf. Um, okay, I also want to talk about the uh, major problem with nitrates in our water. This is out of control, and we've got to talk a little bit about the fires out west and the flood drought, flood drought cycle here in the Midwest. But uh, right now, joining us uh, from Fairfield, Iowa, is uh, Ann Dietrich with the Truth and Labeling Coalition. Ann, welcome to the program. Hi, Ed. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So, um, labeling of GMOs. I mean, before we talk about what's happening at the State House, well, nothing's happening right now, but what happened this year, what might happen, tell us why it's important. Why is this an issue you're concerned about? Well, there's a lot of stuff going on to be concerned about. But I feel I'm focusing on this because, first of all, I think um, it's time that we had the right to know what's in our food. I think this is the time to remember why we fought the Revolutionary War. The freedoms that we have in this country are those things that we sacrificed and we earned. And the corporate takeover of our food supply is something we let happen. And I think, I don't think anyone has the right to tamper with 
our food without our knowledge. Okay, so uh, I mean, we we have requirements that I mean, I mean, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most ingredients in a food product must be listed in the label. Perhaps yeah, there are some that don't. Labeled. You're right. Okay. The FDA has the authority to do this. Irradiated food. It goes, the list goes on. No, yeah, every, no. If, no yeah. That's a good question. if food is irradiated, that must be referenced on the uh, label as well. Yeah, is the 1964 Truth in Labeling Act required transparency in labeling? Everything mm. had to be labeled, mm-hmm. but genetically engineered ingredients were exempted from the 1960, well, Truth in Labeling Act because of a deregulatory initiative in 1992 by Senior Bush, who put Vice President Dan Quayle in charge of a deregulatory initiative, which allowed the FDA to say, okay, genetically engineered food is basically the same as conventionally grown food, so we're going to exempt it from any labeling requirements. And that's how it got into 80%, 90% of our food now without without us knowing it. Now, I'm curious, you've probably studied history uh, a bit on this. Uh, Back when when the Truth and Labeling Act was first established, uh, were there components of the food industry, the industrial food industry, that resisted that effort? I'm going to I'm going to spend some more time on that and you know I'm I'm not real qualified to to go into that right. but the idea is that we we're working with a former four-term congressman from California Congressman Jim Bates who's mm-hmm. a master strategist and he was the one he was in Congress at the time this happened yeah. and he, the that was kind of the feel this was um this is something that got slipped in so that you know basically to support industry mm-hmm. and and, you know, that's what deregulated the banking industry. Sure. And, the, and we know that we're, we're setting things right. My, my, my suspicion is that, that, that all along, uh, industry always resists any effort to provide any kind of regulation or any kind, any effort to, um, to increase public awareness as to what goes on behind the scenes. I mean, we saw the response to the whole pink slime scandal. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe scandal is the wrong word. But uh, industry always tries to, again find ways of, of keeping itself, uh, you know, somewhat operating in a, in a manner that is a little bit under the table. I mean, well, it's interesting they like that. Now, it's, it's interesting <laughs> now we've kind of got, we've got the food industry, a lot of the food industry supporting labeling now. There's, um, you know, there's a huge effort in California to right. label it. And there's 26 states now that have all launched labeling initiatives. But now, are, are there any, are there any yeah. big, big entities? I mean, I imagine that the ConAgra's of the world, the Monsanto's of the world, I mean, well, not Monsanto, there's but... There's the food industry and then there's the chemical industry. Right, well, yeah. But what, but what about some of the big food corporations, uh, the, the big name brands? Is, is, the, is, the, is the support for GMO labeling primarily among smaller companies, uh, smaller farmers, organic farmers, or well, are there others that are supporting it as well? Well, I think the tide is changing. I think the big food companies are going to, beginning to realize that the fight against labeling is just not not worth it. And all along is that I feel like when companies realize it's more profitable to make food that's nourishing and healthy and good good for your body, it'll be in less gimmicky and mm-hmm. more that that'll, that'll become profitable to do that. They'll do that. But and is it? But is it possible for? for bigness to also produce wholesomeness. I mean, to, to my way of thinking, once you get to a certain, uh, a certain scale, your, your, your focus is on the volume of the product, not the quality of the product. And that's, and so, so it's, to me, it's a, it's a contradiction. You're never going to see a, an industrial food system that is producing the healthiest, highest quality, freshest uh, stuff available. That's going to come from local sources. It's going to come from small farmers, from, you know, co-ops, from small networks. Yeah, I agree with you. I think you're right. So, I mean, I think we're always going to have this this tension between those of us who want to go in that direction and those who are in the food, quote, industry to make money. Yeah, I agree with you. So what, I mean, so so again, uh, given given the um, the logic of, of uh, requiring that GMO products in foods be labeled, what kind of response are you getting from the uh, state capitol, a place where logic sometimes uh, meets a dead end? Well, the senator, on, or who is it, Rep. Bolcom introduced a, a labeling bill. It didn't. Get Joe Bolcom from a, Iowa City. Yeah. Yeah, and there was a hearing in the Senate. It hasn't gone anywhere, but there's a 
um, Kraus, Stan Kraus, he's wanting to run for governor. He wants to run Bob as Krause. the GMO. He, he wants to run as the GMO labeling candidate. That's Bob, but, Bob um, Kraus, the uh, fellow who yeah. ran for the U.S. Senate a few years back. Yep. Right. But the thing is, I, uh, the principle that we've been working under for the last six years, focusing full time on achieving a federal mandate to require labeling, is capturing the fort. You've got a gold mine, a silver mine, and a diamond mine. And it's all controlled by the fort. Well, you can go after the diamonds, but, and then you can go after the gold. But if you capture the fort, you've got it all. And the thing is, my perspective is that the people have spoken. I mean, when you have 26 states that have already launched amendment, you know, initiatives. Well, and, no, you, when you say launched, uh, are there, how many states actually have enacted a GMO labeling provision? Um, or are they, are they even allowed to do that? the first one. Um, Rhode Island's close. Um, which, which was the first one? Connecticut. Now, so, so in Connecticut, that's interesting. I didn't realize you could do that without violating interstate, interstate commerce law. So Connecticut? Oh, they, yeah, I mean, really? they, there's a lot of intricacies they have to have. The bill has to have, like, uh, another state that borders them. They ha- it's, they've got a lot of fine print. Okay. But the fact of the matter is only the FDA can mandate a label mm-hmm. on a product that says contains genetically engineered corn. So what, ha- what happens when a state, and now, if Iowa does pass this, what, what does that mean? It would say made, made with the process of bioengineering or something. But, 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 but are we able to do that, given what you just said about the FDA and, and given interstate no, commerce it's a, laws? The, um, It'll be challenged. It can be challenged, too. Okay. So we but could pass the law, but it probably it might not be constitutional. Yeah, but see, tactically, to get it labeled, that's why we focused on um, a federal mandate. And I don't know how mm. much time we have, but I am so excited about what's happening in Congress. And I really sound like I'm Pollyanna here. And I really <laughs> set out, you know, I was really Mrs. Smith goes to Washington. <laughs> but I was at the Expo East in Baltimore, and my son is was in D.C. and I said, right, here's, my, here's the time. I've got it. And I walked into um, Representative DeFazio's office and sure enough, they were, would jump at the chance to introduce legislation only um, Kucinich was his issue when it hadn't really gone anywhere. And then he was redistricted and so sure enough, Senator Boxer and Representative DeFazio have introduced the Genetically Engineered Food Right to Know Act and okay. 30 co-sponsors. But what happened last Thursday is even more exciting. Thursday, a week ago, Thursday last. The Senate Appropriations Committee on the Fiscal Year 2014 Agricultural Appropriations Bill passed Senator Lisa Murkowski's amendment to require labeling of genetically engineered fish. Really? It, it passed 15 to 14, and Iowa Senator wow. Harkin voted in favor of it. Okay, that was close. And yeah, and Kirk um, from Illinois voted. Um, he's a Republican from Illinois. He voted for it, which was very encouraging. And what and what does that what does that uh, bill do specifically? It gives one hundred and six hundred eighty thousand um, dollars in the budget for the to the FDA to re, to label genetically engineered fish. Okay, specifically, any, any fish at all? Specifically those from Alaska, from Murkowski's home state, or, or what's the deal fish. there? Fish. Fish, generally. Okay. Yeah. So it, this isn't, that's, that's not a lot of money in the federal scheme, but basically they will be required to, lo- to, uh, to um, this is, I mean, what it sounds like to me, this is the first success on a specific food product regarding GMO labeling. Right, it's the first, you're right, it's but, the first recorded I mean, vote on labeling in the okay. Senate. And, but again, of course, it has to go through the full Senate. What's it look like there? Um, well, it, has, it went out of committee, and it'll go to the floor of the Senate this summer, hopefully before um, the recess hmm. in August. And then the House Appro- Agriculture Appropriations Committees will also have, you know, have to bring theirs to the floor, too, and then... There's some idea that it'll go into um, conference and it'll get yeah. worked out. But yeah. um, if you listen to Senator Murkowski as she introduced this amendment, and she she talks about messing with nature. Right. And if you hear Senator Boxer support, you know, praising and lauding Senator Lisa Murkowski for doing this, and and saying how genetic um, engineering is opening a Pandora's box, and if you listen to John Senator John Tester, who's an organic farmer right. from Montana talk about with climate change and the weather patterns happening, you know, the escapement issue and the contamination issue. I mean, these people are passionate. There are people in Congress in both houses because we've met with more than 250 of them. Now, what do you say to people on the other side who say, well, 
because of climate change, because of increased threats to our crops from from uh, floods, from from droughts, uh, from insects, from blights, from from uh, from all sorts of plagues, um, we need to look at GMO. Uh, opportunities to help protect us from some of those increased risks. What do you say don't, to that kind of response? Go there. I don't. I don't. I don't believe the propaganda that everyone else has been. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna pay lip service to that. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty strong <laughs> argument that's made. I mean, I think that maybe it's, it's a myth. None yeah. of the like Doug Gray and Sherman, the Union of Concerned Scientists, has published studies on its failure to le- yield. This stuff hasn't done what it. It's sold more. It has sold more um, chemicals, but it hasn't done anything it says it's going to do. I mean, some of the farmers will believe that it's kept their corn standing, but, you know, there's plenty of other farmers that, you know, I don't want to get political. Like, I don't want to get down down that. I think that, that um, w- labeling genetically engineered food is a kind of a moral imperative. I don't think people, if you're changing the genetic code of your food supply. People have a right to know about mm. that. I mean, and I know I talked to um, Senator Bozeman's office in Arkansas, and I, I basically wanted to know, why would anyone vote against labeling genetically engineered food? Because I didn't get it. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, the, the, the bottom line is no matter how you, how you feel about the safety or the risk associated with GMO foods, People have a right to know what they're eating. That that's the bottom line. And I don't. I, I again. I do also. I, I also agree. I, I fail to understand the opposition uh, from people well, I, who just believe that open, the government should be open. That that we should know as much as possible about the stuff that is uh, sustaining us in our lives. Right. Is that the end of the conversation, or should we go on from there? Well, I. I well, it's um. Here, here's a deal for you. I've got to run on because I've got another guest joining me soon. I got some some other stuff I've promised I'd talk about. So we do have to wrap up this segment. I'm running a bit late too. Okay, well, what what but, what Senator Bozeman told me because it was that if we label genetically engineered food, people are people will think that there's something wrong with it and they won't buy it. Yeah. And if, well, but if they don't buy it then the companies will stop, will source non-genetically engineered ingredients and farmers will stop contracting for GE. And the thing is, I talked to a farmer here right in, right here on a century farm and he plants non-GMO because it's cheaper. The seed's cheaper right. sure. and he gets a dollar premium at the elevator. Hey, Ann, I've got to run to a break, but let me put you back on hold and while we go to a break, you can talk with Maddie about, what I'd like to do is invite you to line up uh, maybe I mean if you if you have contacts in some of these sure. uh, senate senate offices where senators you mentioned sure. Bo- you mentioned Boxman and um, Tesser um, and you mentioned one other person I'm blanking on now but well, if there's you have, Sanders in Vermont and there's Merkley in okay. Oregon okay well if any of those people if any of those uh, people you've worked with would like to uh, be on this program or have a staff person who you've worked with I'd love to get some additional input I really would like to have more conversation too about the arguments about safety versus expedience versus necessity. I, th- I think that's a conversation that that people are interested in as well. Uh, I mean, well, I, I you, know, you won't get politicians talking about that, but I can get you scientists. That would be great. To talk about that. That yeah. would be great. And let me put you back on hold. You can talk with Mandy about getting something like that set up during our break. Um, I really want to thank you for joining us. And folks, uh, we will be, we'll be back here. We got more to talk about before Max Wellman joins us. Got to talk a little bit about the European response to uh, the NSA spying. They're not, not just spying on us. They're spying on European Union offices in Brussels and elsewhere. We've got to talk a little bit about the nitrate situation. Uh, it's um, bad news here in Des Moines. And um, there was one other thing. Oh, the horrible fires going on out west and the, the tragedy with 19 firefighters being killed. And what does that have to do with climate change? Well, hard to know. But I think there may be a connection. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. <laughs> From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live.
the dawn of a new era begins. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Wellman, folks, and Max will be with us uh, pretty soon here. I want to thank uh, Hawk Restaurant for sponsoring this segment of our show. Also, um, the uh, Fighting Burrito, another one of my business allies. Uh, Story County Veterinary Clinic, Ritual Cafe at 13th and Locust. Boy, they were busy this weekend, as was uh, Fighting Burrito. Compliments of the uh, Arts Festival. I also want to thank uh, Sergeant's Garage at 6th and College, Dan Kelly's Real Estate Business, and folks, um, please go to my website. Check out more information about these businesses on the uh, on the uh, sponsors page and uh, support them. Help them understand uh, that they are, let them know that they're appreciated and that uh, their support for this program is necessary. Okay, um, again, Max is joining us shortly here, but we got a few things to cover. I'm really concerned really concerned about the uh, nitrate situation, as is Bill Stowe, the head of the Des Moines Waterworks. Um, it's a record surge in nitrates, a record surge. And, you know, you should be concerned primarily because of the effect on your health. I mean, the, um, the impact on the potential for birth defects. You know, this is, there's two sets, of, um, two sets of research, one done by scientists at the University of Iowa, the other done by the Environmental Health Perspectives, a group that just published a, uh, a paper last week uh, that found that babies born, it, it, interesting, the, the study was done in Iowa and in Texas. Finally, Iowa and Texas have something in common. We were, um, we were studied and it was found that mothers who drank even small amounts of nitrate in the first trimester faced a larger risk of birth defects, such as spina bifida and cleft palate. You know, I don't even want to know how they conduct such a study like that. I mean, I, I don't know. Obviously, you can't get somebody to do that willingly. Or I, I don't know how they do that study. But I, I'm presuming that because these groups obviously don't put out stuff they can't defend, they, they have a prestige, they have some prestige and some uh, reputation to uphold. I presume there is some credibility to that. You know, and again, nitrates, of course, do occur naturally. But the problem is um, we are pumping way too much into the land and thus into the water. Now, again, you know, as you know, it's common, it's common for nitrates to um, spike in the spring during the planting season when all that stuff is in the ground and the rains are, and the, the snows are melting, the rains are heavy. Um, but this is a, a very long period for a very high concentration of nitrates. Um, what else? You know, the, and beyond the effects on babies, um, long-term nitrate consumption uh, is linked to cancers to other birth defects and uh, to miscarriages as well. Um, it's also very, very costly. It is likely to add $500,000 in higher treatment costs. It already has done that. And Bill Stowe is saying our water rates are probably going to go up because of the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the increased costs of removing nitrates. And again, this is done with a, um, a system that was put in place a few years ago. Um, it's a $4 million Four million dollar plant. This is a four million dollar system designed to remove nitrates when they get to this level of concentration. And um, again, why are we picking that cost up? You know, shouldn't the people who are polluting the water, who are dumping too much on too much too much nitrates, too many nitrates on the soil, shouldn't they be responsible for helping to pick up the cost? I mean, beyond the whole concern about the health effects and the and the the tragedy. I mean. Could you imagine being a mother and your baby's born with spina bifida and then you learn that it has something to do with the nitrates in your water? How's that going to make you feel about the folks upstream who are polluting your water? That your baby's born with a cleft palate. How's that going to make you feel? I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no compensation for that. That's, that's, um, that's a tragedy that could be prevented where there's, there's nothing you can do. Uh, to make that parent feel better. Um, there's no monetary value you can place on that baby's health. But beyond that, again, you know, we're paying specifically through the nose for the cost of removing that stuff. Okay, so um, why not have greater requirements? I mean, this is the argument that's been made. Why not have tougher standards on the application of fertilizer, on what, we're, what, what, what we allowed to escape farm fields uh, through soil into the rivers? Why not? Well, 
Um, it, it makes it makes perfect sense to me. It makes sense to some farmers like Mark Peterson, who was on this program last week, who points out that, yeah, we get some farmers, meaning we get subsidies. Farmers have you know plenty of money coming in through crop insurance and historically through other means. And in the past, uh, that's all that's been tied to conservation. Of course, the U.S. House, in addition, in addition to wanting to eviscerate the uh, food stamp program, they're eager to disconnect, disconnect, uh, you know, subsidies from any requirement to do anything of greater public value. Well, this has Bill Stowe pretty upset, and we're going to hope to get Bill Stowe on this program again. He's a he's a very articulate guest who's not afraid to say his opinion. Um, you know, basically, voluntary does not work. You cannot say, okay, please do something to help us out. And yet, here's your big crop subsidy payment. You know, it just doesn't work. It does not work. At some point, we're going to have to have regulations that require buffer strips along streams that uh, that require. And I know more of that's happening, but it's got to become. We got to we got to be really aggressive on this. Buffer strips along streams, um, either no crop. You know, don't not raising crops on on sloped land or having having much more um, aggressive approaches to retaining soil in those areas, uh, you know, grass waterways, um, the terracing. There's, there's lots of things we can be doing. We've got to get to the point, though, where the, we reduce our nitrate inputs. I mean, it just has to happen. If you put it in the soil, it's going to end up in the water. It's not only going to kill the shrimp industry down in Louisiana. It's going to kill people right here in Iowa. It's going to kill babies. It's going to, you know, create more cancer. We, we've got to stop. We've got to stop playing gentle with this issue. Voluntary does not work. And so, you know, I here's my call to action today, folks, on this issue. Call Bill Northey, the Secretary of Agriculture here, who is agreeing with Harry Arenholtz. Harry Har- Harry Arenholtz is with a group called I love these names, Agriculture's Clean Water Alliance. Oh, that is so warm and fuzzy. I just want to give that guy a big hug until I learn more about what it's about. It's a group that's dominated by ag retailers. And they primarily, they're in the Des Moines and Raccoon watersheds. And they are, they are vehemently opposed to any regulation. They're opposed even to the possibility of regulation. They don't even want to talk about regulation. It's all got to be voluntary. Okay? Now... This guy, Harry Ironholt, says, quote, a regulatory scheme won't bring us the results that we want and need. Oh, great for you to say that. Have voluntary, compl- has voluntary compliance brought us the results? No, we're looking at the highest concentration of nitrates on record. We're looking at spending at half a million bucks more this year just in Des Moines. And you're okay with transferring the cost of that to the ratepayers here in Des Moines? You're okay with this $4 million plant we had to put in? Because... Because a, a, a voluntary approach, um, sorry, a, a regulatory approach won't work? Okay, well, we, maybe we have no control over him. But folks, we elected Bill Northey. Bill Northey agrees with this guy. He agrees that, that the voluntary approach is what needs to work. I am so fed up with that. I am tired of seeing our health impacted by greed. And I know that there are challenges. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I don't want to put Iowa agriculture under. I, agriculture is important in Iowa. But it is time to learn how to um, how to how to tie your public responsibility with the benefits you receive from crop insurance and other sources. It's time to find ways of reducing and eventually, to the extent that we can, eliminating nitrates that go into our fields that end up in our water. We can do that, but it's going to require some honesty. Voluntary is a failure. Regulatory. Uh, uh, approaches need to be enacted. All right. That's my high horse on the nitrate issue this folks uh, this week, folks. Um, again, this is a big problem. It's gotten worse. It's probably going to continue to get worse. And we need to address it seriously. So this week, if you have a few minutes, send Bill Northey an email. Give him a call. Maybe you'll run into him at a ribbon-cutting event somewhere. Tell him this voluntary stuff is a crock. It's unacceptable. We need standards that are going to protect human lives, protect our water quality, and improve how we treat Iowa's soil. All right. Hey, um, when we come back from a break here, um, Max Wellman is going to join me. I'm always uh, thrilled to have Max on the program here, one of my favorite local musicians. <clears throat> Again, I do want to thank um, thank uh, Tally's Restaurant, Bar, and Catering. also want to thank the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit and uh, Community CPA and Associates, also, the uh, Fighting Burrito, and of course, my anchor business sponsor, Gateway Market. I want to remind you too about the uh, Des Moines Metro Opera. This is uh, happening right now. 
I, I want to talk a little bit about about that with Max because I'm, I'm betting he has some opinions about about the opera as well. Uh, again, three performances. This is an incredible uh, troupe that have been around for 41 years doing three performances in the cultural and culinary crossroads of America. Back in a minute. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought a long couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. I'm Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Jazz Rocks in Des Moines, and a big part of that is Max Wellman. Max is uh, joining us here in just a minute. I do want to thank the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit for sponsoring this segment of our show as well and remind you about a great opportunity to learn how to grow or just establish your business. That's going to be November 9th. Uh, 500 people nearly went last year and about 100 good business ideas came out of that. So great way to learn how to put your dream together. I want to thank uh, Tinker Heating and Cooling, Hawk Restaurant, and also Story County Veterinary Clinic for helping to uh, make the Fallon Forum possible. A couple things real quick. Um, Europe, Europe is really upset at us right now. I mean, they're, it's not just the Green Party. It's um, it's the it's the entire government in Germany and Brussels. Uh, I mean, they're really upset at us. They're talking about sanctions against us. In fact, for this spying, we're going to talk more about that this week because that's a big story. Um, we're also going to talk more about the um, about uh, health care. Uh, some are saying that the Affordable Care Act and the exchange is going to be wonderful. One guy in today's paper said, "quote It's a train wreck." We're also going to talk about the um, the uh, fires in Arizona. Uh, and elsewhere, I mean, this is a, this is unprecedented. So many things happening with our weather are unprecedented. It is because, in my opinion, in the opinion of 97% of the scientists, it is because of what we have done to the climate. All right, so um, 
Plenty to talk about later this week, um, but now I'm going to shift gears. Um, again, we focus a lot on issues on politics, but we also talk about culture because we ha- we are, again, the cultural and culinary crossroads of America. We've got so much going on. 8035 coming up this week, the Arts Festival this past weekend, and we got Max Wellman. I mean, with Max, um, I mean, if, we, if, the, if the only great musician we had in Des Moines was Max, that would be enough. Unfortunately, we have a lot more, but I'm delighted to have Max back in Des Moines and back in the studio. Max, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I always like being on your show because it's like a big uh, palate cleanser between big issues. It's like, let's talk about music now. Speaking of palate, palate cleanser, you've kind of, you, you sound a bit, a bit uh, hoarse uh, there. You know, I had 20 shows in June and uh, yesterday wrapped up the last two of them and I, they were wonderful. The last one was at the Arts Festival. Uh, but I, I definitely, I paced myself well because yeah. immediately following that show, I was just, the voice yeah. was gone and I was exhausted. So we'll, we'll go easy on you today. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Of course, in, in, in English, we say you have a frog, a frog in your throat. Yes. It, it could be worse. This could be a French show, in which case you would have a cat in your throat. Right. They actually say which that. It, cat it, that in sounds the throat. a little more accurate. That's more it's what also it feels like. much more painful. Yes. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, we won't quibble over the distinct, no. the, the linguistic distinctions between uh, going on. French and, and, and American uh, palates. Uh, <laughs> yeah. One thing that's going on is the opera. Yes. I love the Des Moines Metro Opera. Um, I've been up there a couple times already this year um, performing for their company and their patrons. Performing not in the back. opera itself? but No, no. Sorry. Okay. Um <clears throat> following the performance, uh, gotcha. they'll, they'll have me put on a show in the lobby or last this past weekend, it was at, uh, um, the new black box facility, mm. uh, up there at Simpson. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'm just always every year, uh, more and more impressed by that company. Mm. And it's kind of, it's really, I don't want to say it's taken for granted here, um, but it, it's really interesting to me, the general awareness of the mm-hmm. opera company, because outside yeah. of the state of Iowa, right. it is a nationally renowned right. It's like our art company. festival. It's yes. nationally known. I mean, yeah. and, and we don't appreciate that stuff here. Over Sometimes. half of the people that come to the opera are from out of state. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. And they, of said, state. and they sell out their wow. season every year. Yeah. Wow. Over half of the people mm. come from out of state. What, a, what an honor. I mean, yeah. really, what, what, a, I mean, that, that takes some incredible work, yeah. some, uh, f- some f- phenomenal talent as well and some real good organization. Well, the thing that I, um, and I, I tell them this all the time. Um, the thing I appreciate about it is that they clearly have their own standards, you know, and it, do, it doesn't make sense. It's another one of those things in Iowa that you wouldn't expect to run into in the middle of Iowa. Yeah. Someone decided to start a world-class opera company. 41 years ago. Yeah, yeah, and they ago. did it, you know. Yeah. It, I think that's a, a wonderful yeah. example. Well, we have a strong tradition of opera here in the, yes. in the state, too. All these uh, small, these county seats, small towns across mm-hmm. Iowa, you've got, in, in most of them, or many of beautiful them. Beautiful opera houses. Beautiful opera houses. Many of them are being renovated, too. Yeah, it's a huge, a huge thing right now, and I'm so happy to see that. Yeah. yeah. So what do you got coming up once your uh, voice well, returns? this morning, oh, I'll, I'll be back at it. Probably by about seven o'clock tonight, I'll oh. be fine. But um, <laughs> the uh, big show I announced this morning was um, for July 10th, which is my birthday, uh, at Cafe de Scala, which oh. is my very favorite restaurant. It's a great place. Yeah, uh, yeah I love I love Tony Lemo and, and everything they've got going on there. A beautiful place. And he's opening up the restaurant specially for this concert. Mm-hmm. Um, My good friend, Ron Roberts, who's a guitarist who spent an awful lot of time here in Iowa until he moved last year, him and I used to perform all over with Mm. each other doing a duo kind of thing, Mm -hmm. which is usually kind of risky as a singer to do just a duo with a guitarist or a pianist. But I love singing with him. Very sensitive player. Great guy. Yeah. And... uh, and so he's going to be in town that week. And uh, so we're going to put on a show at Cafe de Scala at nice. eight o'clock on July 10th. Okay. Eight till 10, maybe? Yeah. I'm not sure. Until the show's done. Till the show's done. <laughs> I like that. I like the casual yeah. attitude there. That's good. And uh, I, mean, I imagine that's going to sell out pretty quick. I think so. It's it's very mm-hmm. limited space and I've already got reservations pouring in. So if you want to get a spot, uh 
pretty much get a hold of me in any way. Okay. You can email me at max at maxwellmanmusic.com or you can send a message to me through my Facebook page okay. or a direct message on Twitter. I mean, pretty reach out to me and I'll get your name yeah. down. All right, good. That's a, that should be a lot of fun. It's a great, oh, it great will, ambience. And, uh, I'm I, I don't. Forward to it. When you said Ron Roberts, I was thinking of my friend who runs uh, 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 the uh, the travel uh, the travel service here in uh, Johnston. But oh, no, different Ron Roberts, different one. Yeah, okay. Yes. But that's a uh, especially somebody you've had a long standing rapport with. That's uh, yes. I, that's, that's I mean, there's many different. It'll be a beautiful night. Uh, like I said, it's my birthday. I'm hoping to have some family and friends there. It's one of my very favorite places in Des Moines, and mm. I haven't played with Ron for about a year now, and mm. uh, he's one of my favorite people to play with, mm. so it should cool. be great. Yeah, nice. Hey, um, what else you got going on? I've, I've heard there's a concert with the Grapevine yep, coming up yep. as well. And then uh, on that's right after that, on July 12th, I'll be playing at the Grapevine, which once again, that's uh, just a wonderful thing that they've got going on, a listening room <clears throat> in Clive. I've only been to one. That's Bonita and Keith Crow. Yep, yep. I've only been to Great one of their people. performances, never at the Grapevine. Was uh, it at their house? Yes, at their house. Yeah, I, which I was I a very nice, it when very nice that, environment. Yeah. But but they've really pioneered the whole house concert concept right here in in Iowa. It became kind of a, a big thing, or Des Moines, I should say. Uh, there's a lot of that going on in Ames and in really? Fairfield. I know, but uh, anyway. Um, all of this information you can find at my website, maxwellmanmusic.com, or you can like me on Facebook. Of course. Or, you know, any any of the things. I'm If it's out there, I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. So. That's, uh, that, that's um, yeah, I mean, Benita and Keith do a lot of those. The Grapevine has mm-hmm. a, a whole, I mean, a regular Every concert. weekend, yeah. yeah. Like, there's at least one or two happening every weekend, I believe. Two every weekend. Two every weekend. Yeah, Friday wow. and Saturday, and they've been doing it for several years now, and... Uh, they, they're just the best kind of people. Uh-huh. Um, very, very supportive of live music. And uh, yeah, so that's July 12th. And the the Discala show is the 10th. So that'll be a great couple of days. Right. Well, uh, Max Wellman, folks, always a delight to have Max on the program. Uh, we try to steer clear of those controversial issues because we don't want to well, we tarnish your reputation. It, but that's right. Yeah. I, I have to remain. Yeah. yeah. Well. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> well, there are plenty. Of, you, there are plenty of musicians that have pretty strong opinions, and some I'll get away with it yeah. uh, on both sides of the uh, the uh, of the, the of the issue. But uh, yes, but uh, you don't need to do that. Well, not today. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Max. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, folks. If you want to get in touch with me. Max, uh, if you want to get tickets to the uh, birthday celebration at Cafe de Scala on the tenth, uh, maxwellmanmusic.com or org. Com. MaxWellmanMusic.com. Also, again, the upcoming event with the grapevine. Um, yeah, so um, we're going to move on, folks. Uh, call, it, call it a day here. Uh, there's so much I didn't get to talk about. We'll talk about um, some of it tomorrow, but also tomorrow. Tomorrow is um, the third installation of our new program uh, called A New Beat on Learning. We've talked about the Montessori program. We talked about um, child, uh, you know, uh, ch- uh, what am I saying? Um, midwife and doula issues. Uh, that's I won't, I won't revisit that. We're going to talk more about that at some point. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the um, controversy over when school should start. You know, there are some folks who are blaming the state fair and the tourism industry for preventing school from starting when they think it should. There's a lot to that conversation. And joining us will be the uh, Des Moines School District's own Phil Rader, who's been on this program before. We hope to have uh, another guest, too, to kind of provide a little bit more, uh, a little broader perspective. But uh, that'll be part of our conversation tomorrow, along with some of the things I did not get to today, um, like Donald Trump. Again, I don't want to talk about Trump for too long. That's too painful. But there are a couple things i got to say about the guy. We're definitely going to talk about the uh, situation out west with the fires and also the... Uh, Fascinating cycle we see here in central Iowa, in Iowa rather, between drought and now flooding. Highest, the the, the most rain ever we've seen in the period from June, from January through June. The rainiest spring ever. Okay. Plenty to talk about as always. Again, this is a short week. We'll be done uh, Wednesday. will be our final show. Thursday and Friday, taking those two days off. And you should also take them off and enjoy the fact that we've got a great country. And there are plenty of things to celebrate, despite all the problems that we tend to talk about here on the Fallon Forum. Again, I want to thank the Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit for sponsoring this segment of our show. I put that November 9th date on your calendar because it's a a great opportunity to really learn about 
how to make your business grow. I want to thank Tinker Heating and Cooling. Remind you, too, of Hawk Restaurant in the East Village. Story County Veterinary Clinic for your critters, one of my other business supporters. Also, Dan Kelly's Real Estate Business. Ritual Cafe at 13th and Locust. And don't forget Tally's Restaurant Bar and Catering. Great place for lunch, supper, um, also for Sunday brunch. And I'll bet Max Wellman has probably played there before. I have sat in with several people there. Tina Haas Finlay. Ah, well, I've, I'm actually got one up on you because I've played at Tally's. Oh, <laughs> I played there for uh, for uh, St. Patrick's Day. Of course, you because did. I, of course, I, exactly because I had to. <laughs> All right, I folks. I want to thank Maddie, formerly Arrington, now Kane, my producer, and I want to thank Webcast One Live. I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live.